Okay, good morning, Sarah. Morning. Okay, please, could you introduce yourself? Sure. So, my name is Sarah Bletcher, and I'm a filmmaker from South Africa. Um, and I've been working in the industry for, oh my goodness, 20 years, I think, maybe more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. So, I've been living and working in Johannesburg, um, where, which is the background for many of my films. My first question would just be in regards to the name of the film, Mayfair. Um, for, could you perhaps explain for those who aren't familiar with Johannesburg um, the reason for naming the film Mayfair and also briefly, perhaps with reference to your previous films, why you chose to work with the South Asian and Somali communities in this film? Sure. Um, so Mayfair is a suburb in Johannesburg. Um, and during the time of apartheid, Mayfair was an Indian, so during apartheid, uh, people had to live with their ethnic groups, in, you know, there was apartheid, so people were divided. Indian people lived in specific areas, white people lived in specific areas, black people lived in specific areas. So Mayfair during apartheid was an Indian area, um, and it was, it was actually an Indian Muslim area, part of, part of Joburg. And after apartheid, because it had been a Muslim area, because there were a lot of mosques in the area, because there was halal food, because there was, you know, an Islamic culture in the area, when Somali refugees arrived in Joburg, many of them felt, felt comfortable in, mm -hmm. in Mayfair. So as the old sort of formal established Indian families made money and started leaving the areas when apartheid ended, because they could now live in different parts of the city, the, the Muslim um, immigrants that came into South Africa came into these areas. So you had a big influx of Somalis and Ethiopians arriving and settling in, mm. in Mayfair. And what, what kind of happened and what the background, I, I guess the reason I'm going into so much detail is it, it, it's the background for the film. Mm -hmm. So what happened was that you had these Indian families some of whom, obviously not all of whom, but some of whom were, were gangsters and involved in illicit trades and, and, and gangs controlled large areas of Mayfair. So when the Somalis came in, uh, Somali gangs started competing over turf with the Indian gangs. Mm -hmm. And that's really the, the background of the film. So that's, that's what the film is wanting to portray. I think your question was, what's Mayfair? So May yeah. <laughs> Mayfair is a suburb in Johannesburg, so it's a well-known suburb that people from, it's, there are two suburbs that sort of link together, the one is Fordsburg and the one mm. is Mayfair, um, but people in Joburg know that area and they know the history of, of the area. So within a South African context, this was now a film that was going to concentrate on that area of, with that historic. Mm -hmm. Background. And why did you choose now to, to work with the South Asian and with the Indian communities and work on Mayfair? Because um, for some people, perhaps they might be surprised to find a film about South Asian community in South Africa with yeah. their, their impressions of what South Africa is. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I know that you've worked with um, uh, so subcultures of black communities in South Africa in the past, and you've worked also on uh, African communities in South Africa. So perhaps yeah. could you explain why why did you choose to work with the South Af uh, South Asian community now? Yeah, um, you know the the now question was because I met uh, the the co producers, the two young guys who worked on the film with me, um, and they came to me with this incredible story. <laughs> so it it was a story about one of their very close friends who had grown up in this community mm -hmm. in Mayfair with his father being a gangster. Mm. And he was an incredibly devout, religious, uh, young Muslim man, and had, had come into conflict with his dad over what he felt was his father's hypocrisy. Mm. You know, he had gone and worked in refugee camps and trying to do good and trying to be a good Islamic boy, mm. and came home and discovered, oh my God, this is who my father really mm -hmm. is. And this is the work my father is doing. And so he was conflicted by that. So they came to me with that story idea. And I started spending time in Mayfair and started exploring the world. And I was like, this is Joburg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it was a part of the city that I had never really been involved in. And, you know, I mean, you, if you live in Joburg, you go and buy Indian food in Mayfair. Mm -hmm. So you know Mayfair. But it was, 
it was amazing to me. It was a long process of a couple of years of working with these with these young guys. Um, and them taking me into their mm-hmm. world and slowly taking me into the Somali part of the of the world and it was such it was such an eye opener for me and so exciting because mm-hmm. I think one of the things that I love and I, I think it, it crosses all my films is Joburg. Mm-hmm. You know, Joburg is like the link to so much of the work that I've done in my life. It's such an extraordinary city to me. It's it's a city that is, in a way, like New York. Mm-hmm. It's constantly changing. It's constant influxes of different people that change the nature of the city. And that's something that I'm totally fascinated by. Mm-hmm. So suddenly, seeing Joburg in... I mean, I'm born in Joburg, and not all my life, but half my life spent in Joburg. And suddenly having to see the city in a completely new way was totally exciting to me it was yeah oh, wonderful yes yeah and you mentioned uh, and so this is a very islamic uh, community um, and throughout the film we we see a lot of uh, islamic imagery and the philosophies and uh, even just the, the call to prayer is very prominent within the soundtrack and the, the score um, and in particular, we see these ideals of honor and trust, of submission and sacrifice uh, coming through uh, repeatedly. Um, and in the actions of the two, uh, the two brothers, and I mean, they're not, I don't think they're yeah. related by blood, Mukbir yeah. and Zaid, yeah. um, in the face of sacrifice and submission to their father Aziz, yeah. um, the way that they make these sacrifices contrasts starkly. Uh, and it, it gave me imagery of Cain and Abel and also the prodigal son yeah. from, uh, from the Bible. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, their, their different ideas of sacrifice set them against each other in, in a very... Uh, shall we, I don't want to ruin the film for anybody, <laughs> but in a very difficult way. Uh, and what does the film then tell us about these Islamic ideals and what are the limits of submission and also the extremes of sacrifice? Um. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the film absolutely engages with all those issues. You know, the ideas of Cain and Abel, the idea of the Godfather, you know, the idea of the son becoming the father. Um, and in fact, both sons becoming the father. You know, in, in an attempt to not be the father, they become the father. Well, you know, especially Zaid. Mm. Uh, Mahbir sort of follows in the father's footprints until he isn't. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he, he no longer does. But yes, in terms of sacrifice, the, you know, the, one of the very um, beginning images of the film is the killing of the sheep. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that sacrifice, when, when you watch that, that moment is supposed to be a moment where it's, that's what Zay doesn't want to do. Right, he doesn't want to have to kill the sheep's life. He even says, "I was yeah. hoping I would miss this." <laughs> yeah. Um, so that sets up questions around sacrifice, and it sets up questions around what you actually have to overcome to become the the person your father wants you to be, or to to become to to live your ideals, and whether you can actually uh, do that. Okay. All along, uh, along the, the movies, we have this uh, relationship between Zaid and his father, yeah. which is very antagonist. What can explain uh, this conflict in their relationship? Um, I, I think it's exactly that. I think as a young person, very often we... And, you know, so I'm going to answer that question in a, in a roundabout way, if that's all right. <laughs> but I think, um, you know, I mean, I am a white Jewish South African. So what is a white Jewish South African doing making a film about a a male, I mean female, about a male Islamic world? Like that that is in many ways almost as far as you can come. You know, that, that is absolutely not my world. It's the opposite of my world. My world is very female. My world is Jewish. My world is all these other things. And I think what was so extraordinary in my journey in this film was coming to see the human beings in the film and how similar the human relationships were. So, you know, the, the culture and the exterior of the film is foreign 
but the the nature of people is so similar and it was an amazing experience to me working um, with with Imran and Umar the, the two guys because they had a similar journey to the journey I had so as we were working on the script and as we were working on the story we started realizing how similar we were you know and in the same way that I saw them as young Indian Muslim men and they saw me as this white Jewish South African woman, mm -hmm. we, we started realizing how similar the cultures were mm -hmm. and how similar the family dynamics were. And so for me, I think what I as a filmmaker bring to the story, I think what, what they brought to the story was the culture and the world and the aesthetic. And I think what I brought to the story was my understanding of humans. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's exactly that relationship between, so I am answering your question, <laughs> but it's exactly that relationship between the father and the son that is the heart of the film. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, as young people, we very often, we look at our parents and we just see the hypocrisy. You know, with Zaid, he sees his father as a very religious man who's also a gangster, mm -hmm. who's also killing people. And he wants him to be a killer. And that's not something he can put together until he is forced into a position, which maybe is a position that one day his father was also put into, mm -hmm. where your true self comes. And actually Zaid's true self is a killer. You know, so when it, when it comes to the moment, and I don't want to give away the movie, but when it comes to the moment where he has to murder, he can do it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing that he does with the sheep. You know, like he doesn't want to do it, but actually it, it comes to him and, and maybe part of why he doesn't want to do it is because it's so natural. Yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the two of them are very, are very alike, yeah. um, despite the fact that they perhaps believe themselves to be so different. Um, I really, yeah. really enjoyed that about the film, how I think you mentioned it earlier, how the son becomes the father. Mm -hmm. And despite this antagonism, despite their different beliefs that of, of what they're doing to be right, they actually are both proud and um, both willing to make those sacrifices uh, to then protect their family, protect the people that they care about. Um, I mean, exactly. The, the, the scene for me that, that shows that is the end scene where they're washing the body. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, Zed's dad puts his hand on and him. And it's the first time he really shows him any kind of real affection as well. Yeah. It's, it's really beautiful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they're just joined because you see them as the same person doing the same thing. But it was like at, at the end, the father was disappointed uh, by the way that uh, his son becomes like him. Yeah. He was, I mean, I don't think he was so in, in the way that I understand the story. There are two sons, uh, you know, it's like you said, like the, the, the Cain and Abel story. So they're both, they're both his sons. And the one he is willing to let be like him. Mm -hmm. The one he wants to try and keep pure. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it is a disappointment, but it's also a sadness that being like him made him kill his other son. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, yeah. Um. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So um, we talked about the men and the, the men in the story. I would also like to bring, uh, bring up the point of the women. Um, they're, they're often portrayed in very traditional gender roles um, and defined often in relationship to the men within their lives as, as mothers, wives, uh, sisters, girlfriends. Um, and they're, they're shown as loving, loyal, devoted, hardworking. But I also wanted to point out that there are several moments where they go against these, these sort of narratives which are expected of them and challenge the men in the story. I'm thinking in particular uh, of uh, the scene where the wife says, no, I'm going to do this, I'm going to sell the company, or of when the sister uh, devises a plot to try and free herself, or when um, Amina you know, stands up to Zaid and says, no, that's not what we're going to do. Like, you have to consider me as well. And how important are these moments for you uh, in the grand scheme of the film? And why did you cho choose to portray the women in this way? 
I, I don't know how else to betray women. <laughs> so the, 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 the women for me, you know, they're the ones who have agency, who make the de decisions that affect the plot. Um, and yeah, that's the way I understand women. So I, it was impossible to, to you know, it is, it is a world where women are more submissive. Um, and it is a world where women, particularly the, the world in Joburg Mayfair, which is, you know, the one I, I got to see a little bit, but it is a world in which women are invisible. Um, but not powerless, you know, they still have the power of making decisions, of affecting, I mean, in, in this case, of affecting the story, of affecting the plot, of, of having agency. And yeah, I... I can't imagine making a film in which women don't have agency. I would see no point in that because, yeah, that's not the way I understand the world. I think mm. women do have agency when they take it, and those are the stories I'm interested and in. Perhaps you could also mention very uh, shortly about your work with Swift, I believe it is. And, yeah. And um, just for those who, those who perhaps don't know about that. Mm -hmm. um, um, okay, so yes, I think Maria and I had a long conversation <laughs> <laughs> about this, but sure, I'm happy to talk about it. So um, I think it was about four or five years ago, um, a group of women in South Africa came together. And, you know, the, 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 the big problem, I mean, I can't say the, the big problem, there are lots of big problems. But for me, a huge problem in South Africa is the amount of gender-based violence in the country. It's, it's higher than anywhere in the world, the amount of violence against women. And... I think as filmmakers or people that make TV, in a way you cannot be engaged in filmmaking or making television without engaging in the issues of, of fighting against gender-based violence. Because I think that as filmmakers, we have the tool of entering people's homes every night. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we, we have such a powerful tool to change behavior. If you show a different kind of behavior, you present different possibilities to people about how we can be different. And so I think in, in many ways, it's almost impossible to not take that responsibility seriously. And it got to a point in my career where I and a group of other women came together and said, okay, so what do we do? How do we use this tool that we have and how do we try and change behavior in the country? Because it clearly needs to happen. And the, the, the biggest thing we realized is that the, the, the best way of doing that is getting more women involved in the industry. Mm -hmm. Because the minute you start having women involved in the industry, you change the culture within the industry, firstly. So that that's the culture that people live in and then that's the culture they start portraying. Mm -hmm. But also you can impact on what is going out, on what is being portrayed. You need women writers, you need women directors, you need women cinematographers, you need, you need more women in the industry. So we set up an organization called SWIFT, which is Sisters Working in Film and Television, to literally look at that problem, to say, okay, why aren't there more women in the industry? And how do we bring more women into the industry? Mm -hmm. um, and that's the work that SWIFT has been doing ever since. So the, the, the first thing that we did, uh, uh, I was explaining this to, to you, but the first thing that we did was we were like, okay, so let's do a study. Mm -hmm. Let's find out exactly what is going on in the industry. Why are women not in it? Are there women in it? Are we not seeing? Are we not understanding? And the findings of that study were really interesting. I mean, were interesting on many levels. I mean, the, the one big problem that we realized was that, you know, there was so much sexual harassment within the industry that women were just leaving. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's like if women work in an industry where there's so much sexualization and so much it's sexual so harassment. It's so hostile to them. Why would they stay? It's yes. so hostile. Why would they stay? But it's also, it's like you're asking women to do jobs and you're tying their hands behind their backs and you're saying, okay, now go and be a filmmaker. You know, whereas actually we need people to be able to have two hands to do their, their job. So there was this, hor I mean, there is a horrible culture of sexual harassment within the industry. That, that's the one thing we found. The second thing we found was, and, and this was so interesting because it's something I didn't expect, was that, you know, women were involved in the industry in the early parts of their career. 
and then in the late parts of their career, but sort of in the middle parts of their career, there were no women. Mm -hmm. there, there were no women working in the film industry from like their 30s to their 50s. And we started trying to unpack why. And you know, the, the industry is so unfriendly to mothers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you look at that's the, the time in women's lives where they have babies and where they're, you know, having families and the way the industry is designed it's almost impossible for women to work in the industry in those periods so those those were kind of the big issues that we found as as, as the result of the study and those are the industries we've been I mean those are the issues mm -hmm. we as an organization have been trying to tackle so it's like when you ask me about like empowered women yes that's my thing I mean, like I, I can't, I can't. Much. That's why I wanted to bring it up. Yeah. I can't portray women in a submissive way because that would go against everything I have ever done. Uh, could you tell us uh, more about your filmography? Sure. So I, I am. I was very lucky. I studied at NYU in New York, mm -hmm. um, and then my very first job. Um, leaving NYU after I graduated, was doing research on a BBC um, frontline documentary. So they sent me to South Africa and said, you're a South African, you go and be our fixer. <laughs> and go and come and tell us what is happening in the civil war in South Africa, just as apartheid was ending. And I came home to South Africa and met my husband, who I interviewed. He was one of the first people I interviewed. And then I stayed and never went back to New York again. So I stayed in South Africa, um, started working in documentary. So I, my career started working in documentary films, um, doing journalism, news, current affairs kind of productions. And then from there, I moved into drama. It was, I think documentary became for me very, very difficult because I think what, what, what happened and what I, what I realized when I interviewed somebody and then he was killed as a, as a result of doing that interview, I, documentary became for me very, you, you, you would affect people's lives mm -hmm. without knowing what that effect mm -hmm. would be. Um, but you could have big ramifications, like the, the guy who got killed. I, I mean, I, I, I don't think it was my fault he got killed. But somebody found out that he'd given an interview and he was murdered. Mm -hmm. So documentary became very hard for me and I realized actually you can tell the same thing in, in, in fiction, but you don't affect people's lives in the same way. So I started working in television drama. I made uh, some drama series and then luckily I got to make a feature film. And then have been making feature films ever since then. Um, but well, when did your first feature film uh, come out? My first feature film was a film called Otello Burning, mm -hmm. um, which was about yeah, it, it was about the time when I arrived back in South Africa. So it was about that period of South Africa's history where um, apartheid was ending, when there was a big change. Um, and it was a story of a group of, of young boys coming of age at that time when, when freedom was happening and about their relationships with each other. Um, yeah, I think all my films somehow uh, play out on a big uh, background, but it's a small personal story that happens against, uh, you know, the change of apartheid. Mm. Or in the case of Mayfair, it's you know, an influx of, uh, of refugees and asylum seekers moving into an inner city. So sort of against the background of a big uh, geopolitical or national, I don't know what you want to say, mm -hmm. but it's actually the small story of the, the people whose lives happen against that, mm -hmm. that background. So the first film I did was a Taylor Burning. Then I made a film called A Yanda, which was, um, which, which, which I actually made for my daughter because mm -hmm. I, I realized that there were no real role models for young African women mm -hmm. trying to grapple with being modern in, in the African content, mm -hmm. African context. 
So, yeah, I made, I made that film for my, my daughter. It's the story of a young girl coming of, coming of age who sort of is exploring her own creativity and her own uniqueness and sort of forging a pathway for herself in the world. And then... You mentioned also there was some controversy, or well, some problems that were caused for your filmmaking. How was it with the, your most recent film about... Uh, was, I can't remember how it's pronounced, but the, what Anna said, something along those lines? Oh, Desek Anna. Yes. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? So that... <laughs> that, that, that was a story, uh, again, about a world that... I know nothing about it. was about uh, Afrikaans community, um, and it was a story about a young girl who was abused by her stepfather. Um, so that story, yeah, I mean, in in, in many ways, I, I I think people thought that that would be the one that's closest to me because it's at least a white community. Mm-hmm. But in fact, it was it was really interesting because for me, it was the most foreign film. Mm-hmm. Out of all the, like in terms of worlds that I had absolutely no access to, it was because I had grown up in apartheid, that Afrikaans world for us was something that was so rejected. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was something that we, we looked at and said, no. Mm-hmm. So, so for me to make a film about that world was, was, it, was it was challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, really good ultimately. And I, I, I think that in terms of, you know, it, it's something I knew nothing about. There's a whole Afrikaans film industry in South Africa that sort of like coexists with the other film industry, but there's very little crossover. So the one industry almost knows nothing about the other industry. And it was really an interesting experience for me to get involved in that industry, you know, to work with people that were making films in, in, in Afrikaans, because I, I think... Um, I think it's something that I realized that's very similar to what happened in Germany after the war. Mm-hmm. You know, when there was like new German cinema, it was, it was Germans grappling with a history of the war and a history of, you know, what had been the role of Germany in the war. Mm-hmm. And I think in Afrikaans cinema, it's very similar. I think that... Uh, you know, young Afrikaans people had to grapple with you are the people who did apartheid or our parents are the people who did apartheid. How do we now look back and not make cinema that makes the world all white and all pretty? Mm. Like how do we look back and and see backwards in a different way? Mm. And it's it's really, it was really interesting to me that to, to see that thing happening um, it was, yeah. Okay. And you did uh, My Fair in 2018. Yeah. And the first image uh, of the movies is in the dark in Kenya, in a Kenya refugee camp. Yeah. Why, decided, why did you decide to start the film in Kenya, uh, uh, not in Johannesburg, where the, the rest of the film takes part? It's, it's shooting. Yeah. Um, I, I think if you, if you look at the journey of the film, the journey is of a young man who's think he, who, who thinks he's broken away from his father, mm-hmm. who thinks that he's on a course to, to live his life in a, in a direction that is far from his father. Mm-hmm. As far from his father as could be is doing good in a refugee camp, helping people get food. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when he gets kicked out of the refugee camp for, for trying to be good, that's when his whole journey turns mm-hmm. and he now starts to become his father slowly. So the, the idea was if the film was going to end with him becoming his father in his father's home, we have to start with him not being his father as far away as possible. And I also, I, yo, I was so interested in Dadaab. <laughs> it is such an interesting place. Um, yeah, so. That, that's the name of the refugee camp. That's, that's yeah, the that's the name starts. of the refugee camp in, in And Kenya. why in the, in, in the, in the night? Why in the night? Yes. Well, 
Mm. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> because we were we were thinking, you yeah. know, the film it starts even with uh, Zaid sort of breaking the law with a deceit. Like, yeah. he, I mean, he's trying to do good, but he, 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 he the film starts with this dark and uh, tense scenes in a in a camp in a refugee camp, which deteriorates into desperation and violence. Um, and we were just wondering, like, there, there's, there seems to be a lot of use of these the nighttime, the daytime, uh, to to show different things about when Zaid sort of to make steps to lose control. It almost always seems to be in, in the dark. Yeah. And we were wondering whether that was something that was a conscious choice, or whether it was just. Ah, I wish it had been. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it wasn't a conscious choice. I mean, the, the conscious choice is, is playing with colours. So if you look at the clothes, it's like they're white and white and white and black. And like that is, that is in terms of good and evil. And, you know, consciously the, 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 the aesthetic of the film is very bare. You know, like there's, there's, the walls are very white and plain. And that's something that, that I definitely noticed within that world, you know, like in, in that... Joburg Muslim Mayfair world, you can't have adornment. Like adornment is anti anti Islam. So there's there is very, very little which which contrasts so much with the film Ayanda that I did, which is, you know, it's such a rich, warm, colourful film. Um and then suddenly to to have an aesthetic of a film which is you know, I mean, when, when, when you do filmmaking, the last thing you ever want is a white wall. Mm. <laughs> if, if you work with an art director, if there's a white wall, they'll put something on it. Mm -hmm. They will always, because it's just, it's so aesthetically quite displeasing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not colorful, it's not warm, it's not rich. But um, yeah, that's, that's how we played out this film. And that, that, that was very conscious. It's actually interesting that you mentioned that because the next question that we have it has to do with the, the settings um, and the, the small closed rooms, which almost always seem to have a mirror in mm -hmm. them. And there seems to be a lot of shots where you cleverly play with the angle of the camera to uh, either show the same person twice in the reflection or to show uh, somebody else who isn't in the original shot through the mirror. Uh, and again, these are found in relatively small, confined, otherwise bare places. Um, and a lot of the time in moments which are very tense, um, uh, with a lot of antagonism, either between the characters or within the characters when they're making, having some kind of internal conflict. And so was this also a, com was this also a decision that, that you made, or was this just the art director saying we need to put something on the wall? No, I mean, that was a very <laughs> conscious <laughs> That was a very conscious decision. You know, it, it's that idea of if you look at Zaid, so Zaid is presents, especially when you first meet him, as a person trying to do good, trying to change the world, trying to make the world better. But actually, who is he? Like, who, when, when he looks at that reflection, who is that reflection? And that reflection is literally his father. You know, it is a person that is capable of incredible evil mm -hmm. um, and incredible badness. So it was uh, an attempt to create that layering. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, can you tell us something about the casting of the, the film? Yes. Yes. Um, okay, so yeah, I, it, it, because I come from a documentary background, mm -hmm. I much prefer natural acting. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't like acting that feels acting. Um, you know, I, I, I like you to be able to think you're in the real world and that you're with the real people. Um, and in, in South Africa, there is really very, very, very few Indian actors that act in a naturalistic style. Most Indian actors in South Africa are very influenced by Bollywood and very in, influenced by, you know, exaggerated, big, mm -hmm outside acting. Mm -hmm. um, so casting was a huge problem in this film, uh, just because we couldn't find Indian actors uh, to, to be able to play um, these roles. So <laughs> actually, when you go to Mayfair, there are a lot of mixed race people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who are Indian, there are people who are colored, there are people. So many of the actors actually are, are not Indian. Um, they're coloured actors. But in terms of the Somali casting, 
Um, other than the the main gangster, Somali gangster, all the other Somali actors are people that we found in Mayfair. So they're non actors, who which is you know what I, what I love doing. I, I love working with a combination of actors and non actors. I think that working with non actors is incredibly difficult, um, but working with actors and non actors. That, that combination allows the actors to get the realism from the non-actors and allows the non-actors, I mean, the, the actors guide the non-actors through scenes in a way that is very difficult without the actors there. Um, I mean, it was, it was funny seeing the, the, the film we saw last night from Reunion, particularly the first film, because you can so easily see where an actor could come in and just guide a conversation mm. so that the conversation moves forward. Mm -hmm. Whereas with non-actors, very often they repeat lines mm. um, because they don't know how to make a conversation go to the next part of the conversation, uh, particularly in improvised scenes. So it's, yeah. Anyway, that was an aside, but yeah. just something that, that occurred to me last night in watching the film. Wonderful. Um, you mentioned earlier about the, the different types of South African film. Um, and there's the one scene, the, the, the climax of the film, which happens in the old Avalon, um, which has been bought up by this gangster Jalal, who I guess represents sort of the bad guy who's been pulling the strings all along and making, every, making everybody else, else's lives go, go wrong. Um, during that scene where Zaid comes back after having this realization that it was Jalal all along, the, the film projector, which is casting onto a white sheet with a, with a sort of a seam on it, it gets knocked over and the image gets put to the side. Uh, and then we have all of these lights, moving images, really projecting onto the characters as they, as they have this fight scene. Uh, and we also have this very, stark silhouette in in the, the moment uh, the, the really tense moment of the film um, how important are these these this light, play of light and dark and the and the film screen and how also important is it is the the film the trailer that's being played of joe bullet like this is a, a, one of the first south african films to be cast all black um, so firstly maybe you can say something about the meta level of filming a scene in the cinema and having the fiction of a gangster film become reality in front of us. Ah, also, you, you've just made yeah. my day. Because, uh, like, if one person noticed that, then I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> so you really did make my... I mean, that's, that's all very intentional. Yeah. So um, Avalon, that cinema that, that, that is portrayed in the film, is that there is such a rich history of Indian film screenings um, in, in South Africa, you know, like through the apartheid days. So there were a bunch of cinemas and there were a bunch of businessmen who opened, Indian businessmen who opened cinemas um, across the country, which was, it was, it was a huge, um, I mean, if, if, if you look at some of the very wealthy Indian business families, uh, their, their own cinemas, and there are many of them, so, in a way, Avalon, I mean, Avalon was one of those iconic cinemas that it, it, there's nobody in South Africa that won't know Avalon. So it was a, it was a, an, a, a homage to that time of cinema. And absolutely, Joe Bullitt was, <laughs> I mean, Joe Bullitt was, yeah, it was one of the original black gangster films in South Africa that just was extremely widely seen. So the idea of that being played in, in, in the cinema, we... we crafted the whole character of Jalal, and this was really Imran and, and Umar, the, the two producers I worked with. You know, they come from that world of those cinemas. Mm -hmm. So for them, you know, having this, this homage to, to that world was, was so... Like almost Al Capone in his... Totally. <laughs> yeah. And there, there was, I mean, there were gangsters who literally dressed and... and uh, and crafted themselves around those images in the films they were seeing. Um, so that was Jalal. Mm -hmm. Jalal's, that was Jalal's whole, whole world and character. So I'm so thrilled you saw that and I'm so <laughs> thrilled that you saw the dog shut <laughs> <laughs> So yes, thank you. 
Ok, in all, all along the, 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 the movies, we have uh, this word which always come money, 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 money. Yeah. And we take example for uh, money, we, tr we all trust in religion, culture, nationality. Money, we all believe in. When the money goes wrong, everything goes wrong. Yeah. Is you are way to criticize a neoliberalist, a neoliberalist system in South Africa? Actually, it's the way to criticize my own personal family. <laughs> because, it, you know, it's, it's in, in my family, my, uh, my father and my uncle were in business together. And things went wrong in business, and the family ratted. Uh, so I, I think that's that's what happens so often. Um, you know, it's that people put so much in in money, which is so nothing. Like ultimately, it's nothing, but it can tear things apart. Mm. Um, if 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 you look at the power that money has it's the power to destroy things and that's i think what i've experienced in in my life but it's also clearly what i've experienced in the world so yeah i think, that's I think it's a, a criticism of my dad and my uncle <laughs> and the system to me and definitely the system <laughs> I mean, it's very interesting how we see all of these characters who are ultimately there. I mean, maybe apart from Jalal, who's only interested in making his own private cinema where he can watch gangster films with his friends. Um, we see the Somali, Hassan, he's, he, he shows Zaid, hey, the money that, we, that you owe us, we're yeah. going to use it to, for the <clears throat> betterment of our community. Yeah. We see that uh, Aziz also, he's, he's giving to charity. Yeah. We hear a quote, none of this would have been possible without your father. We see the, the, what, the property work where they're building homes for students. And ultimately, they're all trying to, to work towards bettering their friends, their family, their communities. But this striving for money uh, as you say, it, when it goes wrong, everything goes wrong. <laughs> yeah. And that's where we see also these sacrifices uh, and these violence and this manipulation starts to begin. Um, yeah, so maybe we're saying we're criticizing the system, but I would also ask, uh, do, you, do you think we should also demonize the people who are then forced into these positions? So when we look at Zaid and we see that he's capable of evil, mm. Um, are we supposed to um, be a, uh, find that abhorrent or are we supposed to understand how that happened? I mean, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I can't judge characters in the films that I do. I show them. Mm -hmm. Because I think that everything is... I mean... The, when you make a film, you have to be able to understand those people. Mm -hmm. and, and in understanding them, you understand their complexities. You know, you understand what drives the good, but you also understand what drives the bad. And I, I don't think anyone is good or bad. Mm -hmm. I think everybody is both of those things. And I think you present that rather than judge. I mean, as, as a filmmaker, you, you present that, you, you don't don't judge it and and maybe that is a flaw in the film mm -hmm. I, th I think that the film if the film was able to judge uh, it would be more clear you know and I think that somewhere along the film it's not clear and I think it's because it is it doesn't doesn't want to judge mm -hmm. and that's anyway that's yeah I'm not um, sure that is answering your question but it is how I feel I, I, I feel like when people go to cinema, people want to see a definitive thing. Mm -hmm. People, it, you know, it's like one of the things I'm doing at the moment is I'm working on a Netflix crime series. And when you watch these crime series on Netflix, you want to know who did it. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want to be left um, unclear. Torn inside about yeah. how to feel. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. 
But life does tear you apart about how to feel. And I, I think that's something that I as a filmmaker and maybe I as a person struggle with is that I actually don't think there's an answer. You know, I think that the, the journey uncovering is what is so interesting. But I think that's not most people. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I think, I think that's all the questions that we have for you. But perhaps you just mentioned that you're working on a, a Netflix uh, series. Could you perhaps tell us a little bit more about what, what's next for you, what, what that is, and uh, how, we can, uh, how, how we can keep up to date with that, when, when to expect that? Okay, so actually with Netflix series, you're not supposed to talk about them until they get released. Okay. So, um, but it is, yeah, so I've gone back to documentary filmmaking. Okay. And I've remembered all the reasons why I left it. <laughs> Going back to it. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I love reality. I think that when you sit in a room and you make things up, you're limited by your own imagination mm -hmm. as a filmmaker and as a writer. Reality has no limits. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I was listening to a pod. I mean, I was, I was listening to a podcast recently, which was talking about war games and how the generals who play these war games are limited by what they think could happen. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they get people to play the war games who don't understand war, mm. they throw in new things that nobody could have imagined. Mm. And that the generals who are like, the ship is going to be here, will there be a nuclear attack, what's going to happen? They, they can't imagine beyond what, they what they've seen yeah. or what they've studied or what's happened before. And I feel like reality is the same thing to filmmakers. It opens up worlds and doors that are beyond what someone sitting in a room can make up. So I'm, I'm so, I mean, it's been so thrilling working in documentary again. Um, you know, it's just to see how people actually are and what goes on in the world and being, having the privilege of being and being able to see. Um, and when you, when you work in documentary film, it, it, it really is a privilege because people want to show you. Mm -hmm. they, they want themselves to be somehow recorded so they open up in a way that people don't in real life. Um, and it's, it's, it's such a privilege to see that. But it is also the responsibility then of like, you know, you can affect what's going to happen in their life afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is always, particularly in the subjects that I'm interested in, uh, which are stakes, where the stakes are very high. Mm -hmm. You know, the subjects where it's about life and death, where things actually matter. Um, you know, the series I'm working on is this, it's a crime series, so obviously it's a murder. Um, but the murder isn't solved and the murderers don't want the murder to be solved. It's not when they get punished. Yes, yeah, yeah. so people that give you interviews are risking huge mm -hmm. amounts by, by telling you things. Uh, the, the, the risks are so enormous as are the responsibilities. Um, it's tricky. So um, when, when are we going to be able to watch this documentary and also how can we follow what you're doing how can we stay up to date with with you i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i i have had such a whiplash reaction against social media i yeah i i think it's ruined the world okay. and i think it's ruining the world i mean i think it's done lots of really great and good things but i think it's doing so much bad to the world and to children and to new generations that i really try and keep myself away from from social media but the series will be on netflix in march or april next year so it will be a south african crime series so you go on Netflix and search South African crime series. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for have, uh, uh, accepting our stream to discussion. Thank you for the interview and have a nice day.
Thank you, and thank you to you for being my guide to <laughs> Beirut. I have really appreciated it and uh, for inviting me here. It's been many years since I've been here, so it's very nice to be here again. <laughs>